Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from Super Soul Farm, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York City, Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show. And welcome to our Monday morning wake wake over. Wait, makeover Monday. Makeover Monday is a day we just sort of like think about what I want to recreate in my life. Um, there's a little bit of meditation of like, okay, last week didn't work so good. How can I upgrade? So people choose things like, okay, I want to spend a little bit more time. Like um, somebody was saying, I want to chant one round of Joppa before I watch the show every morning. And some people- Where did they say this? Right? They like to join. Wait, wait. Huh? Where did they say this? You said somebody said this. Where did they say There's it? There's a Makeover Monday thread. Uh-huh. There's a Makeover Monday thread on our Discord chat. We have a whole like little chat board where everybody's chatting about their Makeover Monday. I, wouldn't, I don't know if you call them vows, but I guess they're vows. They're, you know, soft vows. Intentions, intentions. Intentions. You know, sometimes we find it difficult to sort of like, okay, this is what I'm going to do all year long. So it's sort of like a one day at a time or one week at a time approach to Mm -hmm. little changes in our life. And Monday is a good day to start. It's the first day of the week. Actually, it's the second day. Isn't Sunday the first day of the week, Mara? I think so. Are you First day of the work week. Are you tired today, Mara? (laughs) No, I'm good. Your picture, you have a poor connection today. Your picture keeps on freezing. Oh, really? You know, it's upstate connections. I'm Mm. sorry about that. Uh, Can you hear me okay otherwise? Yeah. Okay. That's all that counts. Well, anyway, today's Makeover Monday. And today is a great day because it's Lord Balaram's appearance day. I tell you, you know what I love about this whole Vedic paradigm of spiritual life that everything's a festival everything's a festival there's so many festivals there's no there's more festivals than normal days it feels like (laughs) if you ever try to go to these holy cities and do a fast like i just need to fast for a while and cleanse my body it's like you can't there's it's there's a feast for an appearance of this avatar and a disappearance of this saint and a an appearance of this saint and then if somebody's you can't there's too many festivals. I don't even know how people have a... It's two festivals Arvind? today. Ar- Arvind, yeah, saying it's Raksha Bandhan today. Raksha Bandhan. You know What's what that Raksha is? Raksha It's where the sister shows her love and respect to her brother. Have you talked to Sachi? She's got, she's got responsibilities oh, really? to carry it's out. It's Raksha Bandhan. That's a very sweet festival. Mm-hmm. My kids love each other. They came so far, so far, so good. 15 and 13. They, they really like each other. They play all the time. They play rough. I've seen Sachi and, and Rocco go at it, you know, like they're. Well, they're rest, they like to rest. I know. Sachi's like Sachi's good. got like, the weight advantage. <laughs> 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 I, heard, I heard my son tapping in pain yesterday. But that's going to change. That's well, going to change. Well, that, it didn't used to be that way. Because I remember once I saw the two of them wrestling and like Rocco had like such a, had her face like right in the dirt. Like she, and she just got up for that. Like it was no problem. She's like, you're just having fun. Rocco Bundan. Yeah. You like my Wisdom of the Sages shirt? I do. 
if you like it, people, you too can dress like me and Isabel in our Wisdom of the Sages <laughs> shirt. I you got to go to Nicole Super has Soul Yoga. Too. Who's got one? Nicole. Nic- yes. Well, you got to go to supersoulyoga.com and click on the merchandise tab, and then you can outfit yourself in these. In these uh... Mara, did you get one yet? No, I don't have one yet. She would. Rogo, how could you should have sent her one? You know what? She's I didn't get myself one. You her. gave me this one. <laughs> you gave me this one. I'm just, I'm always in a state of overwhelm, and I'm hoping that the Bhagavatam will bring me to sattva, but it's been years and I've never got there. I'm like okay. banging on sattva's door. <laughs> okay, I'm going to make sure Mara gets one. And sattva's not Which letting Which one do you me like, me. Mara? Do you like the, the sage one, or do you like the microphone one? I think I like the sage one. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to get you one of those. <laughs> she does a lot of work, Mara. She does. She's underpaid and overworked. <laughs> <laughs> when you're not paid, yeah. it's under. That's what I mean, I mean by underpaid. She's not paid one cent. It's all, it's all devotion. It's all love with her. Grateful to have the service. See that? Me and Mara have wicked allergies, too. So we want to... Uh, uh, um, we want to Wicked. Apologize in advance. There's something. What is it? Ragweed or something? Wicked. Yes, I mean, I was wicked. All, you know what it does for me? It shuts down my. Huh? You sound Which, like you're from Boston. Wicked. That's they don't. That's what they use that terminology up there. The wicked. Anyway, it's it's a anyway. It shuts down my sense of taste, so I can't taste anything. So Mara made me this beautiful little pie, hmm. and I and a cupcake <laughs> and I could not taste it so they just sat on my desk waiting Gunas, it's me like losing my mind because I can't eat this pie which is my favorite food offered with cooked and prepared with love by Mara wow. and then I couldn't eat it and finally I <laughs> I ate the cupcake even though I couldn't taste it <laughs> isn't that pathetic I ate the cupcake just to get the sense of chewing something soft and creamy but then i got a, a special mercy from the from god it gave me a little window where like like god from above said okay you'll be able to taste now and he gave me like three minutes i was like i can smell i can taste and i ran into that office and grabbed that pie and, finished it. and then the window closed and i was like thank you lord thank you lord for all you give me <laughs> Yeah, a very intimate there's, relationship with the Lord like that, you know. <laughs> Opening there up three is nothing windows. more sad. There's nothing more sad than eating a cupcake just because you know it should taste good, but you can't taste it. That that's is what the, well, that of is an what Bhagavatam says. That's, that's what the Bhagavatam says this world is. What is it? Uh, Puna charvata charvananam. It's chewing, chewing, the chewing that which has already been chewed. It's already lost chewing its flavor. Food. Right, we yeah. do the same stuff. We do it over and over again, even though the flavor is gone, the thrill is gone. We're hoping to get some kind of enjoyment out of it, and we just do this for years and years. That is actually that's such a good verse, isn't it? You want to just say, quote that verse? Let, let me try to. Since we're doing a Bhagavatam verse. class, you might as well, you might as well uh, quote that verse. We may, as well, we may as well speak a little Bhagavatam instead of talking about cupcakes. I used I used it in a shelter lyric. <laughs> yeah. I used it in a shelter there. Chewing the chewed, I couldn't taste it. It was from the first shelter album. But it's such a great verse. It's the idea of material. It's sort of what my my old hashtag, Mary, I used to say. Remember that one? So, now what? Mm-hmm. Right? It's like you do it. You do something in the material world that's fun. And you're like, all right, now what? Now what? It's like I've already done it. And then you're trying to enjoy it with that same high you already had and it's like you got to go deeper you got to go crazier you got to go wilder i watched a uh documentary on um ascending everest yesterday mm-hmm. and people just well, keep doing that all the time and then they get tired just, of it even though and they're all <laughs> dying they're all dying there's bodies everywhere there's garbage everywhere depressed okay here's the verse just, okay you ready This is uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 5, Text 30. And it's spoken by not Sri Prahlad, Sri Praradha, where he says, 
Oh, no, that's Prahlad Maharaj. It is Prahlad. I'm sorry. He says, because of their uncontrolled senses, persons too addicted to materialistic life make progress towards hellish conditions and repeatedly chew that which has already been chewed. Right? That's it. Puna, punas, charvata, we, charvananam. Sure. sure. Right? It's, it's like you, you, you put a piece of gum in your mouth and you keep chewing it, and then at a certain point, the flavor is gone. But you're just, you don't know where to find the higher enjoyment. So you just keep trying to find it in the same place. These things wear down and we still try to stick to it. It's like that, huh? It's exactly like that. The material world. What do you think? Does that resonate with you, Mara, at all? Definitely. Chewing that which has already been chewed in the material world? Yep. Stop trying to chew it. <laughs> You're so flat-lined, Mara. You're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> All right, are you ready? Okay. Man, I got a bad connection today. All right, so we are in a good place, like usual. It's all good here in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Canto 1, Chapter 18, Text 17. Let's read from our secret mantras, our invocation. Narayanam namaskrityan naram chayva narotamam devim saraswatim vyasam tatojayam mudiraye. Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, one should first offer obeisances to the personality of Godhead, Narayan. Unto Nara Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and to Srila Vyasadeva, the author. Nasta Prayeshva Badreshu Nicham Bhagavat Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Nice Sticky By regular attendance in classes on the Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed in loving service to the personality of Godhead, who is praised with transcendental songs, is established as an irrevocable fact. <clears throat> All right. Maybe I shouldn't be living in this area. Maybe this is, you know, maybe this is a sign to move all these allergies. You see, that, you, but you speak against that kind of stuff, Rogue. If you're destined to get that uh, allergic reaction, perhaps you should just, you know, accept it. Well, maybe God's given me the intelligence. No, you know that story of like I think he just wants you know, to that suffer. story of God's <laughs> like you know why God why have you abandoned me? What are you kidding? I was there with you the entire time. I gave you the oars or the I gave you the boat. What's that story, Mara? You know what I'm talking about? Oars. Yeah. I gave you the oars. <laughs> okay, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, text seventeen. Thus, please, us, the narrations of the unlimited. That's, that's a very modern way of saying God. They used it, they even used it back then. You know, the people don't say God anymore. They say the universe, the unlimited. Thus, please narrate to us the narrations of the unlimited, for they are purifying and supreme. They were spoken to Maharaj being full of bhakti yoga. You're full of bhakti yoga. <laughs> you know, is, is Roga's voice uh, cutting out on everyone else? Is, yeah, Roga, you're, somehow your connection is very bad today. So like that verse just got chopped into all kinds of pieces. I don't know if you can hear me. No, he's frozen. Roga, you got a bad connection. I'm going to read that verse again. Thus, and this is the stage of speaking to Sutta Goswami, encouraging him to read on encouraging him to continue with this, the, the, the narrations of the Bhagavatam. Uh, he, he says, or the sages say, thus please narrate to us the narrations of the unlimited for their purifying and supreme. They were spoken to Maharaj Prickett and they are, and this is nice, they're very dear to the pure devotees being full of bhakti yoga. That, which kind of like, um, you know, at the very end of Bhagavatam, there's like the last chapter of Bhagavatam, 12th canto, uh, chapter 18 it just it's a glorification of the Bhagavatam itself and uh, there there's a famous line 
Puranam Amalam Yad Vaishnavanam Priyam. That this Bhagavatam, it's, it's very dear to the Vaishnava. It's very dear to the pure devotees. It's very dear to the bhakti yogis. It's what we find dear. You know, this are generally what we find dear is what's dear to our senses. But for the, for when you actually begin to absorb yourself in this, this becomes the most dear thing, right? Just hearing Bhagavatam. What do you think about that, Raghunath? I think my internet stinks today. Hashtag upstate New York problems. Um, you you went from it went from me saying the verse to you going eep up ear ah or ear up. That's all I heard, and then I heard you said the exact verse I said. So I was like, did they even hear what I said? They didn't, because it didn't. was all chopped up. Yeah. Oh really? I'm sorry. Yeah. It's all right. It's another sign from God. I maybe I should move somewhere. Okay. Text 18. How about that? Are we there? No? Yeah, let's read it. Sri Sutta Goswami said, Oh God. <laughs> oh God, although we are born in a mixed caste, we are still promoted in birthright simply by serving and following the great who are advanced in knowledge. Even by conversing with such great souls, one can without delay cleanse oneself of all disqualifications resulting from lower births. So Sutta Goswami, Sutta is a, means a mixed caste, correct? I think so. Yeah. And, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And, and um, you know, it, it's interesting because we were talking about this the other day in teacher training. There is an external, and we have it in our culture. You can't deny that we have our culture. Some people will say, well, we are from a very good family. We are from a, a very prestigious family. We're from a very wealthy family. We are from a family of athletes. You know, we are from a family. And then you have people who have like family. Well, we are from a family of uh, drug addicts. We are from a family of uh, delinquents. We are from a family of, you know, and some are embarrassing and some are, we're proud of. And so you'll hear this rec Now, by the way, freeze that. But they also have this thing, which sounds very normal in the animal species, like, like if you're into animal husbandry or something like that, like if you want a purebred Labrador, a purebred Cocker Spaniel, a purebred, if you were to buy a purebred dog, you have to get the papers of the dog and they, it has to be from a specific bloodline and those papers have to be, you have to find the parents of the dog. Um, if you do it with like race horses, you can buy a very, very expensive race horse if the bloodline goes back to some, you know, ver uh, you know, a uh, what's the what's the, the Kentucky Derby? Is that a race horse? Is that a race? A yes, horse race? Is. Kentucky uh -huh. Derby. So if you have a winner from the Kentucky Derby and you have a from the bloodline of what, that winner, it's a very expensive horse. So there's this idea of a bloodline being of more value or of lesser value. That's what sort of. The, the Vedic system recognizes that with families. It's going to affect me. If my father was a murderer or if my father was a saint, that's going to affect me and my children. That being said, we can't just say, oh, that means nothing. It does mean something. It means something to the racehorse. But it's not the final conclusion. The final conclusion is, and the Bhagavatam pushes this a narrative again and again, we are spirit souls. No matter what you're born into, you can transcend that. I think we sort of get, that's part of like American philosophy also. You know, you can be whatever you want to be. But it's really true. No matter what your upbringing was, no matter where you're from, high birth, low birth, whatever birth you have, you can transcend. And here is Sutta Goswami. And of course, we have people um, uh, historically, um, people not from... Brahmin families who become great gurus or great leaders or great uh, spiritual um, mouthpiece for the nation or for the, even the world. Um, uh, and in Vaishnava or the devotees of Lord Vishnu, we believe caste means nothing. It's something. It's, it means something of the material world. But ultimately, it's not the highest thing whatsoever because it's not our real identity. It's our partial truth of reality. The partial truth is me and Kastuba, a couple of Italian-American guys from New York. That's a partial truth. 
Mara, award-winning chef from upstate New York. Partial truth, Mara. These partial. are partial truth. <laughs> Don't get all caught up in that, Mara. That's only <laughs> Don't get all caught up. It's you just for one page in the encyclopedia of who you are eternally. So I get this thing, and we can't, and in the name of equality, what we want to do is say, no, 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 we're all the same. We're not all the same. We're all different. We've all, every, twins are different, right? Twins are different. But on the most, in, 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 the, in the truest sense of who we are, in that sense, we are all spiritual beings. And that's where we find our, our connection, our equality, and our unity. <laughs> Boom! think about that Kostuba. yeah well you know you have th this is all being said in a certain context it's being said in the context of we're anticipating the arrival of Shukadeva goswami who is the guru of sutta right sutta yeah. heard bhagavatam from him this the sages are turning to sutta goswami now these sages you you can you can imagine that many of them are, are brahmins right they came from the from and what by that we mean not only were they born a particular family but they were trained from the very beginning of their life in being peaceful in meditation in, in, in cleanliness and in purity in so many different ways. And that type, that type of upbringing and training helps prepare one and qualify one to speak spiritual knowledge. Mm. And so it, it's, it was considered that those are the people that should be the teachers and should speak the spiritual knowledge. Now he's saying, I wasn't born like that. But because Bhagavatam is so powerful, because my guru was so powerful, even though I wasn't born like that, I wasn't born with all that training and all that, you know, all, all, you know, the cultivation of those qualities in my family from birth, I wasn't born into that kind of family. But it doesn't matter because Bhagavatam is so powerful because the influence of my guru was so powerful. So he says, even by conversing with such great souls, even just by conversing with them, by talking with them, one can, without delay, cleanse oneself of all disqualifications, lack of peace of mind, lack of simplicity, lack of, you know, all of those things. It, because when you meet and when you talk to someone like that and you converse with them, they inspire you to change. They inspire you to, yeah. to adopt those qualities that enable one to become a good teacher, that enable one to become a, 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 an embodiment of this wisdom. That's that's what that's it's really getting at. Now, Shri Prabhupada, he writes in the in the commentary. You, you would like to share something? I was just going to say, despite our dented canness, yeah. you know, there's people we that you and I know that just grew up chanting the Bhagavatam from childhood, yeah. and because of that, it's like, in one sense, they're very qualified to speak the Bhagavatam. But the Bhagavatam is so powerful, it can be transmitted through a bunch of dented cans like us. Now, I think you're a little less dented than me, my friend. But I'm that being said, we are all hearing. We all had some you know, crazy background, crazy backstories. Yet we can disseminate spiritual truth by just gripping on to that Bhagavatam message and holding on and repeating it and trying our best to get our ego out of the way. And it's actually, we tangibly see it works. So um, please continue with the purport, Prabhu. So he, he writes... Uh, this means that thousands of years ago, there was no bar to learning or preaching the transcendental science because of inferior birth, which is the point is, is that people nowadays try to exploit their birth and say, you can't be a teacher, only I can be a teacher. And what Prabhupada is saying here is that right in the Bhagavatam, it's made clear, right? It's that, that, that one needs to have the qualities of the Brahmana, not the birth of the Brahmana. So he says the rigidity of the so-called caste system in Hindu society became prominent within only 100 years or so. So he's saying like, it's only the past hundred years ago that people have been misinterpreting this and been saying, oh, you know, they, they brought in this rigidity, meaning it's only based on birth that you can become a Brahmana, a teacher like that. He's saying that's a new thing, right? New thing. And he says that's, that, that it, that's only developed only 100 years or so. Um, when the number of Dwijabundus or disqualified men in the families of higher caste increased. Mm. Right. Interesting. And then he's going to say that Sri Chaitanya, who was accepted as a, an avatar of Krishna himself, he said, Lord Sri Chaitanya re revived the original Vedic system and he elevated Takra Haridas, really important figure, right, to the position of Nam Acharya, 
to like the, the ultimate embodiment and teacher of meditation on the holy name. Um, um, so I, I'll read it again. Lord Sri Chaitanya revived the original Vedic system. He elevated Thakur Haridasa to the position of Namacharya or the authority in preaching the glories of the holy name of the Lord. Although his holiness Sri Haridas Thakur was pleased to appear in a family of Mohammedans. So he wasn't even born Hindu, what to speak of Brahmin, right? He was born in a Muslim family. Um, but, uh, but Sri Chaitanya said, it's not based on his birth, it's based on his qualities. No one is more deeply absorbed in meditation on the holy name. He embodies this more than anyone. So he elevated him to become like the main teacher of that. Like Prahlad, Jamuna Jai says, yeah, Prahlad was also born in a, a family, a different kind of family. Sometimes we get born in crazy families. It happens. Yeah. Sometimes okay. we get good in good families. <clears throat> we can transcend it. Okay, continuing on. Text 19. And what to speak of those who are under the direction of the great devotees, chanting the holy name of the unlimited, who has unlimited... Who has unlimited potency? What to speak of them? The personality of Godhead, unlimited in potency and transcendental by attributes, is called Ananta. They've been unlimited. using that term here quite a bit, Ananta, unlimited. We so, so the, an, yeah, Ananta the listening to the show. So it said in the previous verse, even by conversing with such great souls, one can without delay cleanse oneself of all disqualifications. Mm. And, so this, and then this verse says, so what to speak of those? who are serving, you know, being trained under the direction of great devotees, chanting the names like that, you know, of the unlimited, who has unlimited potency, right? There's like nothing that he can't change. He can change me, you know, even no matter how dented I am. Yeah. It is now ascertained that he, the personality of Godhead, is unlimited and there is none equal to him. Consequently, no one can speak of him adequately. Great demigods cannot obtain the favor of the goddess of fortune even by prayers. But this very goddess renders service unto the Lord, although he is unwilling to have such service. So he's saying... To speak, you're asking me to speak and glorify Krishna... I'm going to do it now, but understand that he's unlimited and I can only glorify him so much, you know, I'll do the best I can. <clears throat> Who can be worthy of the name of the Supreme Lord, but the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. Brahma Ji collected the water emanating from the nails of his feet in order to award it to Lord Shiva as a worshipful welcome. Uh, this very water, the Ganges, is purifying the whole universe, including Lord Shiva. I don't know that story. I don't know exactly what that means either about Brahmaji's involvement. Maybe someone can help. Well, us there were the there were different times where there was another time. There's another story of the descent of the Ganga where um, Brahma made an offense and he and Vishnu told him to collect the water from my feet. Well, there you go. But I don't, I don't remember offering it to Gung, Shiva. I'll research well, ultimately, that. it ends up on the head of Shiva when it comes down, right? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the story. All right. I'm going to find it in detail and tell it tomorrow. Remind me. Okay. All right. Mara, can you send me a text message later? Okay. <laughs> Raghu, read. I do all my research with the uh, children's comic books. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> They've got all the stories better than anywhere else. <laughs> Raghu's doing his deep study now. He's he's dug deep into Amar Chitra Kata, just like going through them. Big font made for my bad eyesight. Lots of pictures to keep my attention deficit disorder mind focused. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Krishna. Now this next verse, this is just an incredible verse. This is a great verse and great commentary. Self-controlled persons who are attached to the person to the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna can all of a sudden give up the world of material attachments, including the gross and subtle, including the gross body and subtle mind, and go away to attain the higher, highest perfection of the renounced order of life, by which nonviolence and renunciation are consequential. Can I read that again? Please. I think it's going to be better the second time. All right, let's do it. 
Self-controlled persons who are attached to the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna can all of a sudden give up the world of material attachment, including the gross body and subtle mind, and go away to attain the highest perfection of the renounced order of life, by which nonviolence and renunciation are consequential. They're consequential. That means you get them anyway. It's consequential. They, it's just natural common. consequence. That's exactly natural, actually. Actually, if we look at the Sanskrit to this, it's, you know, self-control, I b believe the word here is dira that they're using. Yeah, dira. You know, that, that, that's a word that you find in Bhagavad Gita a lot, stita dira muni, right? That one could become a sage of steady mind. That dira means that steadiness. Dira tatra namuyati. Yeah, sometimes Prabhupada translates it as sober, right? So a person that's not shaken by this or by that, but that's just kind of clear, steady. Um, sober to the material world and the, the romance of the material world. You're just sort of like, you're not pulled either way. Yeah. You get it. Now, now if, we, if we look at this verse, self-controlled, well, that means, in other words, and, and then he'll say later, I'll read it again, self-controlled persons, self-controlled, right, who are attached to the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna can all of a sudden, and, and I think by all of a sudden we can, we can think of that as like simultaneously or naturally, right? All of a sudden, like without any delay. It, 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 once I'm attached to Krishna, we can say all of a sudden, like it sounds like it, it happened real quick. But in other words, once I'm attached to Krishna already, I've given up material attachment, mm. right? All, you could say all of a sudden, but just think of like, all, like consequential, he uses the term later. So self-controlled persons they're not controlled by other things which is going to come up now self-controlled persons are attached to the supreme lord sri krishna they can all of a sudden give up the world of material attachment which is so hard to do which is this whole yoga processes that require intense austerity and intense study and intense renunciation to, to try to be cultivating it in different ways to try to get to that point where one gives up all material attachment and that includes the gross body, meaning the senses, what the senses are calling us to do, or the subtle mind. So, so it means most of us are controlled by the body, by the senses, or controlled by the mind. We're controlled by these things, as opposed to this person is called self-controlled. The mm -hmm. self meaning the soul, the atma, that I'm not a slave to the body. I'm not a slave to the pullings of my senses. I'm not a slave to the mind and all the misinformation, miscalculation that's telling me happiness will be found through this, happiness will be found through that. When one's no longer a slave to that, you can call them self-controlled, right? We think we identify with the body and the mind and we follow the dictations and we think we're free. Actually, we're slaves to the body and the mind. And so a self-controlled person is free of the influence of the gross body and the subtle mind. They're self-controlled, atma-controlled, we would say, dhira. You know, the yogis have a different concept of freedom. It's not, <clears throat> our freedom exists in our private way that we live our life and our private choices of how we react to situations. And that freedom can be, can be taken away by just my vantage point, for example, something's happening to me and I'm going to let it ruin my day and my future because Stuba said something and hurt my feelings and I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to resent him. I'm going to resent him for maybe 10 years, five years or a week. That choice is going to affect my freedom, my resentment, my anger, um, uh, how I medicate my pain. Those can, though, and, and what happens is the senses and the mind take over my free will and they own me. Whereas a free person is going to be very forgiving. That's why we forgive, basically. Forgiving is not, it, it liberates me from the pain of my mind. So I have control of my freedom in any situation. But we can be in a so-called free country or living in the forest. But if I'm attached to my tongue, right, the pulling of my tongue, the pulling of my belly, the pulling of my genitals, then I'm a, I'm a slave within my body. And it's the worst type of slavery. That's what addiction is. It's you are a slave within your body. 
and we, we, we people hit a rock bottom with that. So our the the real freedom is is the pulling back of the senses, the uh, uh, the harnessing of the senses, so the soul can actually experience choice again. And this is what the the study of the gunas is so important because as long as we're in rajas and tamas. There's no freedom. Doesn't matter what government you have at all or what the state of the world is in. Our freedom, we own that freedom and, and we practice exercising that freedom. So let's hear that. then what Srila Prabhupada says about this. He says, only the self-controlled can gradually be attached to the Supreme Personality of God. So if you want to actually connect with God, it's when you're not controlled by the body and the mind, but you're self-controlled. Self-controlled means not indulging in sense enjoyment more than necessary. And those who are not self-controlled are given over to sense enjoyment, right? The senses are saying, I need this, I need that, go for it, and just follow it or follow behind. Um, those, then he says, dry philosophical speculation is a subtle sense enjoyment of the mind. So it's, it's very interesting with, with that sentence, what Prabhupada is doing is it's his way of saying, don't mistake superficial renunciation as true deeper renunciation. Just because someone is, um, well, in, in other words, until it comes to that connection with one's divine source, even one's mental speculation and external renunciation it, it is still a type of being controlled, right? Rather than being in control. Mm. And then he says, Sense enjoyment leads one to the path of darkness, not illumination. But if I'm just following the dictations of my senses, it leads me on the path of darkness. Those who are self-controlled can make progress on the path of liberation from conditional life of material existence. And again, when it says conditional life, it means life of my mind has been programmed by externals, just like a computer gets programmed. And I'm following that dictation. So then he says, the Vedas, therefore, enjoin that one should not go on the path of darkness, but should make a progressive march towards the path of light or liberation. Should I put you on the hot seat for that one? Because I know you don't like the Upanishadic ones. <laughs> do, you, do you know that verse from, from the Upanishads that that's, meant, that that's saying? The path uh, of darkness. I'm going to pass light. this one to Mara, my good friend Mara. <laughs> it's a famous one, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, mm -hmm. that lead me from darkness to light. You oh, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We chant yeah. that at the yoga studios a lot. Yeah, it's it's from the Brihad 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 Aranyaka Upanishad. Right. Thank you for. Sure, it's I could read. It's actually part of a well, it's, hot it's seat called, light. It's called the Pavmana. Not too much shame involved. Not too much. <laughs> it's called the, the Pavmana Mantra, or sometimes called the Pavmana Abhyaroha. The the um, it, it's like three little prayers. Asato Ma Sagamaya, from falsehood lead me to truth. Oh yeah. Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya, from darkness lead me to light. Mrityor Ma Mrittam Gamaya. From death lead me to life. From death lead me to immortality. Yeah. So, so anyway, Prabhupada's alluding to that here. He says, the Vedas therefore enjoin that one should not go on the path of darkness, the path of being controlled by my mind and senses, but should make a progressive march towards the path of light or liberation. Michelle, Michelle Berger says she's got a tattooed on her ribs. There you go. There you go. That's a tattoo or a mug or a t-shirt. Maybe that could be a new Wisdom of the Sages t-shirt. From darkness to light. Um, the Veda is therefore enjoined that one should not go on the path of darkness, but should make a progressive march toward the path of light or liberation. Self-control is actually achieved not by artificially stopping the senses from material enjoyment, right? But by becoming factually attached to the Supreme Lord by engaging one's unalloyed senses in the transcendental service of the Lord. Important fundamental conception with bhakti yoga that I'm not going to just shut down my senses. That would be artificial. I'm going to engage them 
but I'm engaged them in relation to my divine source. That, that By it's, the way, it, it's, yeah. it's good to say that waking up and listening, or not even, and even if you're listening to the show, if you, even if you're one of the others listening, that's a type of surrender. That's a type of engaging in service, of hearing the glories, of hearing the Bhagavatam. We're hearing the glories of the incarnations of the Lord. So that is also a type. Sometimes we say, well, what do you do? What do you practically do? This is it. You're actually, you're doing it right now. You're just listening to the glorification of the, the great souls and the divine. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Isn't that good to know? <laughs> <laughs> He says, the senses cannot be forcibly curbed, but they can be given proper engagement. Purified senses, therefore, are always engaged in the transcendental service of the Lord in bhakti. That's, this a, perfect, great, that's a great, that's a great. This perfectional stage of sense en engagement is called bhakti yoga. So those who are attached to the means of bhakti yoga are factually self-controlled and can all of a sudden, in other words, simultaneously give up their homely or bodily attachment for the service of the Lord. Right? Now, this, this conception, it, it's explained in different parts of the Bhagavatam. And, and again, just simply the idea that I could try to be this kind of yogi that shuts down my senses, sits alone in silence. Um, it, but, but what Prabhupada saying is ultimately that is a, it's a weaker process than, than bhakti yoga, which is the process which is 100%. And, and the word I think that was used in this verse was svadharma. It's, it's, um, it's, it, it is, that's what he translated as occupational, or I'm sorry, it's consequential. It was the word svadharma, which means it's the very nature of the self, right? It's the very nature of the self, not to sit silently, it's the very nature of the self to engage one's body, one's mind and my senses through love, ultimately through love to God. That's how we're designed. You know, that's what we're designed for. So it's natural, it's Swadharma, that that can be done, that that, and that they can't be forcibly shut down. So one should act according to one's design or one's nature. And that is to serve with love, engage the senses. And that means in Bhakti Yoga, they can be engaged in so many pleasant ways but it's always in connection. And with that, the renunciation that one tries to cu cultivate artificially, it comes consequentially. It comes automatically um, without extra endeavor. You know, Steve, and, I, I found this to be a, uh, do you want to finish your statement before? I well, I'm leading into something. So it you in. something? Go uh, ahead. You just tell me what I can. Go ahead. Go for it. Okay. What do you got? I, I was just saying, I found this to be sort of um, a glimmer of hope, this kind of idea, because there is a quintessential idea of what a, what a sadhu should be like, what a yogi should be like, and very silent, very self-controlled, very, you know, v extremely sattvic, you know, um, you're whispering, you know, um, you're and I just whispering. found like, it's just, it's just not my nature to be that, and for for it's a not, lot of time, are you sure? No, it's not. I'm qu quite positive. <laughs> for for a lot of times in my spiritual path, I tried to make a square peg fit into a round hole, and you get to this point where like, well, it's not just me, so I guess I can't play the spiritual game like everybody else. I'm going to have to just be a, a materialist. But the very act of desiring is what w the soul desires. It's what the actual soul does. And to think you're just going to subjugate or bury desire is just bad thinking. It's not going to, ha what to speak of if you're a, a, a very sort of like a person like myself is a little bit all over the place. You can't bury that, but you can refine desire. You can refine behavior. You can perfect your desire. So instead of desiring things that have, brought me south, degraded my life, degraded my relationships, degraded my diet. You can desire things that uplift you, upgrade you, make you feel connected, make you feel higher. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of, for, for a person like myself, bhakti yoga was the answer to this sort of very 
uh, flattened curve, flat line um, uh, perception of what being spiritual is. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, I, I get it. I, I, I can play this game too. It's just going to come out different through this like karmic machine that I'm driving around in in this lifetime. I get, to, I get to play. It's just going to be di a different. And it's not artificial. It's not like you're trying to be something that you're not. Yeah, that never works. <laughs> that never works. So, so this, this concept that by in, rather than shutting down the senses, one can engage the senses in, in bhakti. And that through that, what so many people and what what's much of the literature, like say Upanishads, seems to indicate, although it goes deeper if one reads deeper into it, but seems to indicate is that renunciation is like really what spirituality is all about, where you let go of everything material. It's saying that when you fully connect in those, the mind and the senses in service, then that renunciation comes without any extra effort. It, it, it's because you've attached to this, you've let go of that, right? Because, you, because through the happiness and the joy that you found through practice of bhakti yoga, you've automatically let go of the lower taste of the material things. So there's a verse, really, really interesting verse that comes in the 11th canto. And it's, a, it's such an incredible chapter um, where there's a king named Nimi and he meets the Navyogendras, right? Navyogendras Navi are the sons of, of uh, Rishabdhi, uh, 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 another avatar. They're all naked also, aren't they? They're naked. <laughs> what is it? Who is naked? <laughs> this whole book is about nine, nudity. Nine, nine naked sages, right? And, nine and they, naked sages. We had one naked sage. Now we have nine. <laughs> nine of them. And, and, I, would, and I wouldn't be able to focus. If I have, there's nine naked sages <laughs> in class, I, I was like, come on. <laughs> It'd be hard to listen. No, because when they start to speak, it's like, it's different. Right? It's not like you would expect. It's like, whoa, the, 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 the way that they're speaking, is just like, it's, it's like so attractive that you're, you, you, let, you forget about the nakedness. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, what so is, are you going to read from the Lemon Cano a little bit? Yeah, I'm going to read this one verse. And, and um, it's such a great verse. It's this analogy uh, that, that one of the, I think one of them is named Covey and one of them is named Hovey. I forget which one speaks this, this verse of those nine naked sages. But um, this is the verse. There's three things. Devotion, that's one thing, the experience of devotion. Direct experience of the Supreme Lord. In other words, seeing, hearing, smelling, you know, the Supreme Lord. Devotion, direct experience of the Supreme Lord and detachment from other things. All right, these three occur simultaneously for one who has taken shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So if you fully engage in bhakti, then these three things you'll, you'll, you'll experience. The feeling of devotion, the feeling of bhakti, that, of divine love, direct experience of the Supreme Lord, I'm perceiving God, and detachment from everything else, right? All the material attachments are let go. These things happen not that you have to do one to get the other, but they happen simultaneously for one who's taking complete shelter of the Supreme Lord. In the same way mm. that pleasure, nourishment, and relief from hunger comes simultaneously and increasingly with each bite for a person engaged in eating. Okay, when you eat, three things are happening. One, there's the pleasure of eating. Okay. It depends what you eat, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you've lost all your taste and you can't taste the cupcake, then there's no pleasure in it. But, um, but assuming that you're healthy you're right, and you're eating something that's tasty, you eat some nice food. On one hand, you're experiencing the pleasure of the taste of the food. At the same time, simultaneously, you're being nourished by mm -hmm. that food, right? Yeah. And, th and third, your hunger is decreasing, right? You have this hunger and you're letting go of that hunger. You're no longer feeling hungry. And, you know, and that happens simultaneously. It's not like you have to become free of hunger and then you can enjoy taste. It's right. not that you have to achieve material renunciation completely and then you can experience spiritual happiness or connect with God. But when one's practicing bhakti, the three come simultaneously. Devotion is compared to the pleasure. Direct experience of God is compared to the nourishment 
and detachment is com is compared to one's hunger uh, becoming, you know, reduced. Interesting verse, is it not? Beautiful. That has the pretty Sanskrit, right? You, yeah, it's uh, this is the Sanskrit bhakti. That's one thing. Paresh Paresh Anubhavo. That's the second thing. Pada Isha means the Isha means the controller. Pada Isha means the supreme controller or God. So Paresh An Paresh Anubhavo um, means direct perception of the Pada Isha of God. Bhakti Paresh Anubhavo Viraktir. Viraktir means detachment, anyatra from everything else. Right? That trika, trika. These this group of the three. Eka Kalaha, they simultaneously come at one time, right? Not at three separate times. Eka, one, Kalaha. They all come at once. Prapadya Manasya, Manasya, Manasya. For one, in the process of taking shelter of the Supreme Lord. Just as Tushti, which is um, satisfaction, Pushti, which is nourishment. Tushti and, pushti. <laughs> tushti pushti should apayo nugasham. That, they, that these three, satisfaction, nourishment, and the eradication of hunger, they come anugasham. Anu means like to follow or like increasingly, increasingly with each morsel, with each bite. Nice. Uh, so, so, you know, also in the Bhagavatam earlier, we heard that Detachment comes automatically. Knowledge and detachment, jnana and vairagya come automatically for one engaged in bhakti. The idea is that when the body, when the mind, when the senses, rather than artificially trying to shut them down, when they're engaged in devotional service, which is this, the svadharma, the natural, what, it's what's natural to the soul, that automatically n n pleasure comes automatically perception of God comes and automatically detachment comes, right? Automatically detachment comes without artificial engagements to try to make it come. Like I'm going to sit in a ring of fire under the hot sun to do my meditation in the middle of the summer, or I'm going to hold one hand up in the air for the next 15 years to, to try to cultivate detachment. Now just engage your senses in the beautiful service of the Lord. And that you, you naturally, you let go of those other things. What would happen if we joined one of those very peculiar ashrams 32 years ago? Okay, this uh, Swami comes to America and tells everybody, okay, you want to be detached from your body? You got to lift your right arm up. <laughs> that's what we've been, for 15 that's years. What we've been preaching all these years. <laughs> and then we had wisdom of the sages. <laughs> it's just like everyone's got Okay, their, everybody. <laughs> okay, everybody, remember, we got to be detached today. It's going to be another day. We got to get together. We got to, we got to, this is Makeover Monday. I know a lot of you've been thinking about, oh, uh, last week I let my arm down. <laughs> Put it back up. <laughs> oh, there it goes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Come on, Mary, your arm's down. You got to lift it up a little. We can do this. We're all in this together. We got to uplift each other. There's some yoga groups that do this. They're standing with their arm up in the air to, to, to develop, and I'm sure it works, but you know, you don't have an arm. You can't use your arm. You can't play pinball. You can't do anything with your arms. <laughs> but, but, you know, but it works in a certain sense, right? But it doesn't completely work. It doesn't completely work. Right. Yeah. It's, and, and so in any case, uh, there's an ashram right outside of M Mumbai where everybody stands on one leg. Really? In tree pose. Oh. Yeah. For like days on it. Forever, forever. <laughs> this is their life. They have that, their they, life. They're under a tree and they get a little swing and they lean on that swing, right? Yeah, they get a little swing. It's not just standing there to balance it. You get a little swing. You know what I'm talking about. We've seen people on these swings. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. I hope they get something very good out of that. But you so, know. In any, so in any case, you know, Sutta Goswami is saying, hey, just by hearing from my guru, hearing Bhagavatam, you know, all these things come, you know, all that you, all that you're meant to get through the practice of yoga will come simultaneously, automatically, consequentially. And that's the message for today's, today's class, right? That's the lesson for today's class. Well, wow. We'll say something else intelligent. Well, I cue up. Oh, this you know part. what? That, I'll say this because it's Balaram Purnima. This is the esoteric side of bhakti. We're not going to be able to make sense of it for you right now. It's not going to make sense. It's a beautiful part of this. the bhakti. But so, God has a brother. 
And so because we, we didn't go into it today, but Radha Swami will be speaking on his Facebook page, on his YouTube channel. Um, and you can go search it out there. That'll be at 7.30 p.m. in India, 10 a.m. in uh, East Coast time. 10 a.m. We're checking uh, out. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the appearance of God's older brother. <laughs> just, just trust us on this one. God has an older brother. He's really cool. He's really strong. He wears a blue dhoti. That's all you need to know for now. But here, Rana Swami, he'll make heads or tails of it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We've created a platform where if you like what we do, you can donate. And you know what the entry-level donation is, Mara? A dollar. It's a dollar. A buck. The price of, and we can't even think what a dollar is anymore because nothing costs a dollar. Everything is over a dollar. Even at the dollar store, everything is more than a dollar. So yesterday we said it's the cost of a shoelace. I think a shoelace may be a dollar. Or the... Four gumballs can be a dollar also. So for the price of four gumballs, you enter into a vault of yoga wisdom. A treasure chest, a storehouse. You unlock the treasure chest of metaphysical mentors. Yeah, we have workshops, we have classes. Uh, our workshops, we study kirtan, Ayurveda, meditation, Ayurvedic cooking, sacred stories, karma theory, as well as live asana classes practically every day. Not only that, but we have a very growing 12-step bhakti recovery group that you can join. And if you're a Patreon member and you feel like you're getting something substantial out of this service that we do here, then you can always have the ability to up your pledge. People up their pledge from $1 to $5 or from $5 to $10, whatever you do. And it, although it may not seem like a big deal to you, it's a big deal to us, so thank you for everybody who's helping us float this transcendental boat, everybody. And now, I want to thank all you Zoomers who are here with a little dance. We take that namaste, and then we open up our hands very wide, and then we start moving our hands. And I'm glad we're all here and not standing on one foot or leaving our hands. I want to thank all the great yoga masters who told us it's okay not to stand on one foot. You don't have to do that for self-realization. You just have to take those desires that you have and engage them in this spiritual service. 